1 Samuel chapter 17. That's where we're going to be this morning. This is a story um, I think most of us have heard before, right? Anybody ever heard this story before? <laughs> we could probably go out to the mall today and ask people who aren't Christians if they've heard this story. And probably many of them have heard this story, right? David and Goliath. Recently, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, a writer, wrote a book entitled David and Goliath. And the subtitle of the book is Underdogs, Misfits, and the Art of Battling Giants. Now, this isn't a Bible study book. In fact, Gladwell is really talking about overcoming the underdogs in our life. And he talks about even, even ways to use kind of unconventional methods, if you will, to... Um, to, to overcoming underdogs. And I think as we read the story of David and Goliath, we have to understand that it's part of our culture, isn't it? This whole word Goliath. I mean, you, you might even say to someone, that's a Goliath in my life, right? I mean, insurmountable sort of thing that you're looking at. But the story... I believe is more than just an inspirational story to help us under, overcome those under or overcome those obstacles in our life. I think the story is more about that. The more than that, it is really the story of God. It is the story of God moving. It is the story of God acting in history and particularly in the life of David. And so this morning, as we study this story together again, I, I'm not going to. We're not going to read the story like we do sometimes. We read the text and then we study it together. Uh, it's a longer story so we're going to read parts of it along the way. I hope that you'll have your Bibles open and, and you can kind of follow through uh, with me. And, and here's the deal. When you read a story, um, a very familiar story like this, the tendency is to say, well I know what's coming next, right? I know how this works out. And, and to kind of check out mentally. But let me encourage you this morning uh, to, to come to this story and maybe ask the question, how can I learn something different this time I read this story? So let me ha offer a prayer this morning that we would have open hearts to hear God in new ways in this story. Would you, would you pray with me? God, thank you so much uh, for this story of David and Goliath. And God, while many of us have maybe heard this story even a hundred times, we pray, God, that as we read it together this morning, as we engage it together this morning, that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear your word in a fresh way. We pray, God, that you would speak to us through this powerful story. In Jesus' name, amen. Now before we dive into 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, let's review just a second this morning about where we've been. We left off last week, you might remember, with David playing the harp for Saul. Saul has this evil spirit that has come on him and David has called in and David plays the harp and David soothes Saul's soul and helps him with this evil spirit. And we're going to see later today, uh, David is kind of coming into the palace, spending time doing this, and then returning to the sheep field, kind of back and forth. We're not sure how many times he goes back and forth, but that's what's going on here. You might be asking yourself the question, how does this work? How old is David now? How's da how old was David when he was anointed? How old is David now that he's going to be facing Goliath? And again, with any ancient document, there's always controversy. And it doesn't, necessarily, doesn't exactly tell us how old he is. But most scholars feel like that when David was anointed, he was somewhere between 10 and 13 years old. And then he's going back and forth to the palace in those early teenage years. And most scholars feel like that he's somewhere between 15 and 17 years old at this point in time. So he's not like a little boy. He's probably a teenager at this point in time. And so 1 Samuel chapter 17, we're going to read the story together. Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Sakoth in Judah. They pitched camp at Ephi Daminim between Sakoth and Ezekah. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle lines to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. Now there are a lot of big words in this uh, here and you're probably not familiar with these places, right? If you were an early reader, you would know exactly where this is. But since we're not familiar with these places, we do need to know this, that it's simply in a valley where this is taking place. And the people of God are on one side of the valley and the Philistines, the enemy, they're on the other side of the valley. We keep reading here. 
a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall, had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. So, the battle is not happening now. In fact, everybody's on one side and everybody's on the other side. And this guy named Goliath, who is called a champion, steps out. Now, when we think of champion in our culture today, we think of like the one who wins all the time, right? World champion, we might say. He's undefeated, you know. But the word champion here in Hebrew describes a little bit different uh, person here. The word champion here is describing a one-on-one -on -one sort of war warrior. So Goliath is the kind of warrior who doesn't just go with the army and fight with the army. He does this type of warfare where he comes out and challenges the other side. That's what a champion is. And that's why he's called a champion. And this is what he's doing. He's stepping out and challenging God's people. And this uh, detailed description uh, of his armor is here in the text. The shield shield is covering his whole body. Most of his armament was bronze except for the spear's head. It was iron. And if you study history you might know that this is at the very beginning of the Iron Age. So Goliath has the best technology available to him in his spear. It weighs about 600 shekels. That's about 15 pounds. Okay, that's a pretty hefty spear. You get hit with that. Yeah, you're going to feel it, right? Coat of mail weighing 5,000 shekels. That's about 125 pounds. You can imagine when David suits up with that, he's pretty heavy, right? 125 pounds. Not surprising that the Israelites are intimidated by this guy. Look at how tall he was. He was six cubit. I think the NIV translation says over nine feet tall. Some, some say that six cubits would actually be nine feet nine inches tall. It's a pretty tall guy. Archaeologists have discovered a piece of pottery that is dated to this time that is actually inscribed with Goliath's name on it. And we're not sure if it's the same Goliath that's recorded in scripture, but it could be that this guy is so famous that people are making pottery and putting his name on it, right? Kind of like, you know, you have your Colts mug in your cabinet, right? That's your team, right? Maybe they had Goliath mugs, you know, for sale at the grocery store. And you would buy a Goliath mug. I don't know about that, but I think that's just kind of interesting interesting. But here's this, this tall dude. And Malcolm Gladwell in his book um, says and describes Goliath's condition. And what, why was this guy so tall? You might be asking. Most people believe or most medical experts believe that he must have had uh, a particular um, medical condition that would have uh, been a tumor on his pituitary gland that would have created an overproduction of growth hormone. Then people have actually been diagnosed with this sort of disease in modern times. In fact, the tallest person in history is a guy named Robert Wadlow. He's from Alton, Illinois. And I remember going down there and visiting that town and there's, they have a statue there of Robert Wadlow. I'll show you a picture of him here. Um, this is Robert Wadlow. He was 8 feet 11 inches tall at his death in his 20s and he was still growing when he passed away. And Wadlow could have easily hit 9 feet and maybe even more if, we, if he would have lived longer. Many medical experts believe this is what Goliath had. He had this same sort of disease. And so he's 9 feet 9 inches tall. He's very intimidating as you could imagine. Let's look back in verse 8 here. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. And if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Here's the deal. I want, one, I want you guys to send your best guy out. And if you win, we'll be your slaves. But if we win, you're going to be our slaves. One-on-one -on -one battle is what he is proposing here. Any takers? <laughs> it seems impossible, doesn't he? Continue here. 
Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. He's taunting here. Look at the response of God's people in verse 11. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. It's a good way to describe them. Not only are they afraid, they don't, they don't know what they're going to do, right? They're dismayed. They're, they're confused and they're afraid. Goliath has the best technology and I'm sure the most impressive body size of anyone around. Who stands a chance against somebody like this? Now, at this point in the story, or at this point, the story shifts in verse 12 to David. Look at, look at verse 12 with me. Now, David was the son of an Ephraimite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was old and well advanced in years. Now, we met Jesse back in chapter 16, right? And we know that David is Jesse's son, but the text tells us here that he's, he's aging, and the text reminds us that he has eight sons. Verse 13, Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. It says here again, the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So we're reminded of this whole deal where David has been in the palace playing the harp for Saul. He's coming back to tend the sheep. This would explain then how he's back with Jesse now and how he's able to deliver the, the bread and cheese to his brothers. Now, you might be asking the question this morning, how long is all this going on? You know, what's happening here? Evidently, this is going on over here in the battlefield with Saul, with, uh, Saul and, and Goliath. And then David seems to be back over here in Bethlehem. We keep reading here in verse 16, For 40 days the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. So over a month that this is stretched out here. For over a month, we've got Goliath every morning and every evening coming out. And what's he doing? He's taunting. You know, he probably had a different way of doing this every day. He's probably a pretty creative guy, right? And so he's, he's letting them know. And every time, as we said back in verse 11, the Israelites are terrified and they're dismayed. They don't know what they're going to do. Verse 17. Or verse 17. Now, Jesse said to David... Take this ephah of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these ten cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Now I want to show you a video clip here. This is a guy named David Nasser. This is a study that the youth are using. And this is a clip here uh, where he's standing in this valley, in the valley of Elah. And he's describing this. So uh, let's roll this, Larry. You'll need to hit play on that video clip there. grew up not too far from here in a small village called Bethlehem. He was one of eight boys. How would you like to be the smallest of eight brothers? David got looked over all the time when he was growing up. One day, David was out in the shepherd's field when all of a sudden a bear attacks him. David is able to take his slingshot and kill the bear. Another time he gets attacked by a lion and David is able to do the same. He kills a lion. In those moments, I think David could have become arrogant and thought, wow, what a great marksman I am. But I think instead he was humbled because he realized something bigger than him was working through him. That God gave him the ability to be able to hit a bear with precision right at the right place at the right time. It was those hours and hours of solitude sitting there by himself as a, as a shepherd's boy that God was preparing David for his greater calling. In those days of solitude, in those days of just being a servant and serving his father, God was sharpening David and allowing him to get ready for the great battles that were to come. Well, one day, David's father decides to use David to deliver some food. David woke up that morning, and in my mind, he's probably thinking, this is just another day, an average 
day. The only thing may be different is I've got to run an errand for my dad. His dad tells him, look, take this food over to your brothers out on this field. This is the very field that we're in where David was supposed to bring the food. This is the Valley of Elah. David is starting to come this way and right over this ridge as David is coming, I in my mind think that God used this ridge to kind of have a curtain to hide from David's eyes what's on this side because David comes on this side thinking that he's going to bring some bread to his brothers, thinking that he's going to be a servant, a humble man who's delivering some bread. But little does he know that he's about to deliver a nation. He thinks he's just delivering bread to his brothers, but God is saying, no, you're ready. You're my great warrior, and I'm going to use you to deliver Israel. I like how he says that. David doesn't know what's happening here. David just thinks he's on an errand. He's bringing some bread and cheese to his brothers. Let's keep reading here in verse 20. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up and set out, as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines, facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from the lines and shouted his usual defiance. David heard it. When the Israelites saw this man, they all ran from him in great fear. Now, you picture David going out. I mean, he's just supposed to be delivering the bread and cheese, right? He takes the bread and cheese where he's supposed to take it. But then he's like, I want to check out what's going on here, right? So he goes up to the battle lines. And just about the time he gets there, he sees Goliath step out shout the words and he sees everybody run back right to the camp he sees what's going on here and for the next few verses here we get this picture of David kind of assessing things trying to figure out what's going on trying to see what's happening here and again let's remember he's probably 15 to 17 years old everybody there is probably older they're fighting they're experienced experienced warriors but David's checking out what's going on here Look at verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He, keeps, he comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He'll also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. So you can tell Saul's been thinking about this, right? He, he has now a motivation package for anyone who wants to fight Goliath. And what's in the package? Great wealth, right? The king's daughter. We hope that she's good looking, right? And no taxes for your whole family, right? David wants to know more about this. David asked the man, verse 26, standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine and removes his disgrace from Israel? Who is, this uncircumc- who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? If you're reading the text here, you'll notice in more than one place, David asks the question, well, what will happen to the person who kills him? It's like he's trying to figure this out. It's almost like he's trying to sort it out. It's almost like he's struggling with this, this thing that's inside of him that says, maybe I should be the one to do it. We keep reading here. David says, or, or look, look at that. Da- what does David say here? David says of Goliath and of the Philistines that they are uncircumcised. Now, you might be reading this and going, well, what does that matter, you know? It, that's a medical, biological sort of thing, but it's not that at all. That's not what David's talking about. David is talking about the people of God who are circumcised. This has to do with the covenant of Abraham, right? That God is with his people. And the people that are uncircumcised are a people who do not have the blessing of God, who do not have the provision of God. So David is saying in essence here, we are the people of God and they are not. Does anybody get that? Because David doesn't seem to think that anybody is getting it here. Verse 27, they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. You see, David, again, is trying to understand. He's asking questions. And he's in conversation with with warriors or, or people who are fighting here. And then look at verse 28. His big brother comes along. Then Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men. 
he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down here only to watch the battle. <laughs> That's just like a big brother, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, he is upset. He's angry. He's saying, well, what did you do with the sheep? You probably just left them out there. They're probably all dead by now, right? And look what he says about David. He says, your heart is wicked and you are conceited. Now, we know from every other account that David is very humble, right? And we know that David's heart is not wicked. In fact, we know that David's heart is a heart after God. And so the brother is saying things that just aren't true here. But this does give us some insight into what David probably grew up around, right? Some insight of how his brothers treated him. You know, he's the youngest of eight brothers. And remember, not too long ago, in chapter 16, we had Samuel come out and he anointed David and rejected all of the brothers. Maybe Eliab is still bitter about this thing, huh? Maybe Eliab is, is bitter because David was the one who was anointed. We're not sure exactly what's going on here, but it does give us insight that David's brothers were not kind to him. And he had to deal with that. David comes back in verse 29. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? Then he turned away to someone else and brought up the matter. And the men answered him as before. He just kind of ignored his older brother and just kept talking about this. Again, he's going around. He's asking about what, what, what's going on here. You know, what's the king going to do? May, again, I think David is struggling with this whole idea. Maybe I should do this. Maybe David is feeling the call of God in his life to do this. And he's just not sure how he is to respond. The king gets word that David is asking about this. Verse 31. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. So we have David and Saul. Having a conversation here in verse 32. David said to Saul, let, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine, your servant. Your servant will go and fight him. And in other words, David says, look, I've been thinking about this. I've been talking to some people here. And you know what? I'm in. Put me down. When do I go? Look how Saul responds. Saul says in verse 33, Saul replied, You are not able to go out and fight this Philistine and fight him. You are only a boy, and he's been a fighting man from his youth. I can't let you do it, Saul says. Number one, if you go out there and lose, we're all going to be slaves, right? Number two, this guy's been doing this a long time. And he's really good at it. And you're a boy. And you've been fighting for, well, you've not been fighting at all. You're a shepherd, right? Look at verse 34. But David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. David pulls out his resume, right? <laughs> David's like, look, I got some qualifications here. And you might read this and you might think, well, David's bragging here. But David's not bragging. If you keep reading, you'll see here. Look at verse 36. Your servant, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of those. Why? Because he has defied the armies of the living God. David understands that fighting the bear, fighting the lion, and fighting the Philistine is not David versus these things, but it is rather God versus these things. David understands that his success was not on his own. It was because God empowered him in this situation. David says in verse 37, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. Where's David's focus? It's not on the bear, the lion, the giant. The focus is on God and he's concentrated on God. Again, David is not going in arrogance. He's simply placing his trust in God and knows that God will care for him. Verse 37, Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Okay, you can give it a shot, and God be with you because you're going to need him. <laughs> Verse 38, then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put on a coat of armor. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on the sword over the tunic, and he tried walking around because he was not used to them. 
I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five smooth stones from the stream, put them in, his pou in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Now, I would encourage you, uh, if you've not read um, Gladwell's book here, um, to read that because he has a really good account on, on, the, on how this works out. That David actually uh, is not taking on the, the conventional warfare of the day, but rather going in a different sort of manner. And Glad, Gladwell talks a lot about this, the sling and the way in which uh, the, the power of these, these stones would have been like bullets going in, into Goliath's head. And so David is choosing a different method. He, he's going a different way. And I think that's what, what Gladwell is getting at here. But I'm going to stick with the text here. I'm not going to veer too far off of it. David is saying, look, I'm not comfortable. In, 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 the, in Saul's army. I mean, 125 pounds, you can imagine, he could probably barely walk around, right? And he's thinking a sword, you know. I, I think you might make the case that David would have gotten killed if he would have gone this way. I, God could have used him in this way, just like he could the stone. But David's going out in the way that he feels comfortable. Look at verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. Now, Gladwell suggests that with the disease that Goliath had, he probably had a vision problem. He probably couldn't see very well. But he does recognize that David is a boy, that he's young, and he's insulted by the fact that this little kid is coming out to fight him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Sticks, right? Gladwell says, look, David's got a slingshot. He doesn't have sticks. He, he, he can barely see. Maybe Goliath is having trouble see, seeing what's going on here. Philistine, though, he's insulted. He curses David and curses his gods. Come here, he said. I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Look closely at David's words in verse 45. David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Again, David's not bragging about his own abilities. David's not arrogant. He says, I'm simply coming in the name and in the power of the Lord. David's resting on the fact, and I think this is the key point of the story here. David is resting on the fact that God is with him. David's focus is not on the situation. Rather, his focus is on God, who is Lord of all things. David compares the sword and the spear and the javelin to the power of God. And he says, no contest here. Verse 46. This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcass of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those who gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. You see, David's not bright. He's not saying, look how great I am. Look how good I am at this slingshot. Not at all his posture. He says, this is all about God's power. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you down. I'm going to cut off your head. And everybody's going to know, not that I'm great, but that the Lord is great. Again, David understands that God is with him. He understands that he will overcome because God is going to empower him to do so. And when David does overcome him, he's sure that God is the one who gets the credit, not himself. Look at what happens next. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Simply put, verse 50, David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. Look how many times it says, without a sword, without a sword, without a sword. David took down the giant. In detail, verse 51, David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. 
When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Hey, they're not following their part of the deal, right? Are they supposed to be slaves? <laughs> they're taking off. They're getting out of there. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sherem road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem. And he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. The scene closes here with David capturing the attention of the king. Saul wants to know more information about the boy who killed the giant. Now you might wonder here, and this might seem a little inconsistent in the text here, you're thinking, isn't Saul, doesn't Saul already know David? Because David's been playing the harp for him, right? But here in the text, it seems that Saul doesn't know who David is. And so you might question that. You might see that as inconsistent here. I think there are a couple of exclamations. Why is Saul doing this? It could be, number one, that Saul is simply reaffirming who David is. Asking David, you know, his, his family's name, his, his lineage, that sort of thing. Kind of a formality. It might be that Saul doesn't recognize David. I mean, think, think about this for a minute. If you had a 13 or 14 year old boy that went away for maybe even a year to watch sheep and he came back, he's going to be changed in appearance quite a bit, right, in one year. And it could be that Saul is, it doesn't make the connection that, that this guy is the kid who used to play the harp for me. It could be, honestly, he doesn't know who he is. So I don't think it's an inconsistency, but I do think it does, it does raise the question there. But I love how this scene ends. As soon as David returned from killing the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul. With David still holding the Philistine's head, Whose son are you, young man? Saul asked. Ask him. David said, I am the son of your servant Jesse of Bethlehem. Can't, can't you see David there, 15-year-old boy, still holding the giant's head in his hand, standing before the king. What a story, right? I mean, if you're reading this, again, you've, you've probably read this story before. And, and again, I think we, we do have a tendency to make this story really more about overcoming the giant, right? Overcoming the underdog. Everybody likes a story of the underdog winning, right? We like to see that. When, when a sports team that's an underdog wins, we all cheer and say, wow, what a story, right? And it is, it is partly that. But, but I think the point of the story isn't just about the underdog overcoming th this huge obstacle. I think the story is really about putting our trust in God. B because really, if you compare Goliath and God, Goliath's the underdog, right? It's no contest at that point. But here we see, here we see David as a young boy who puts his trust in in God. He's sure that God can take care of things. And so for you and me today, I think that's the application for us. The application is that whatever is going on in our life, however insurmountable it might be, it's not that if we'll just, you know, we'll just go with a slingshot, we'll win. It's that if we'll put our trust in God, God can take care of it, right? See, it's a matter of shifting our hearts, shifting our focus, shifting our dependence, not on our own abilities, but on God. So this morning, I'm not sure how God would be speaking to you. Maybe there's a Goliath in your life this morning. Maybe there's this, this, this huge deal that you're not sure how it's going to work out. Maybe this morning, God would simply be saying to you, place your trust in me. Don't go forward in your own abilities, depending on your own gifts but go forward trusting that that I'll, I'll I'll do whatever I need to do to take care of you you see David's heart is a heart after God's heart David's heart is one that trusts in God even against the giants that he encounters it's a very different place than everybody everybody else was like you know we're running we're afraid we're scared David comes in and he says well what's going on here Aren't you God's people? Shouldn't you be stepping out in faith? No one else seems to do it, so David steps up to do it. This morning, maybe God is speaking to you in some way, and you'd like to make a decision. As, as the band comes forward now, let me invite you 
to respond in whatever way God would be speaking to you. If you'd like to come and pray, the altar's open. If there's a decision you'd like to make, uh, you come now.